morning. I'm so excited to be here today as part of the discussion of leveraging AI to optimize space resources and drive operational autonomy on orbit. And I'm thrilled to be here today with Luca Rossettini, co-founder and CEO of Deorbit. I'm Megan Weber. I'm a senior space product manager at AWS. In my role, I have the pleasure of speaking with customers across the industry to understand their challenges and what technologies need to evolve to help them drive their targeted mission and business outcomes. I'll begin our talk briefly by discussing some of the recurring challenges I hear about, the trends that are driving the need for change, and the use cases these tech changes will enable. Then I'll hand it over to Luca. He's really the main event. So historically, space vehicles were purpose-built systems that met a single mission need, tethered back to Earth for command and control and data processing. In part, this was driven by limited compute capabilities on orbit. All data generated in traditional space vehicles requires storing and downlinking, regardless of value, for evaluation on the ground. This adds latency to any data-based decision-making or action taken on the space data being evaluated, including the required round trip and human round trip required, including from orbit to Earth and back, especially if an action is necessary to be taken on orbit, and the addition, additional latency caused by humans in the loop. Because of these legacy capabilities, space missions are often bespoke with little application flexibility and reusability across missions. These challenges are exacerbated by the growth in data generation in space today. Increased investment in new space has increased the growth of space de data generated in an exponential way. The continued and forecasted growth of data over the next decade exacerbates the impacts of legacy technology and drives the need for us to change how we think about applications on board space vehicles and how and where data is processed. The growing volume of data generated in space is forcing us to think differently about components of new spacecrafts, like processor choices and available CPU, GPU, and the potential that we can rep retrofit legacy vehicles to meet the demands of today and tomorrow. New and different spacecraft components and technology will allow us to move more and more intelligence on board. Processing Earth observation data will allow operators to optimize onboard storage. For example, by only retaining process data that meets their defined um, valuable criteria, as well as the ability to optimize downlink channels by ensuring the bandwidth you're using is being used to downlink data that you know to be valuable. Conceptually, I like to think of the Earth observation of um, optical imaging and the idea of cloud cover. You can evaluate on board whether or not there's cloud cover in the images that you've taken, remove those that do have cloud covers, and you open up additional storage to collect more imagery. And then eventually, when you have the opportunity to downlink, you're downlinking images that you know are actually useful. Artificial intelligence on board will enable autonomous operations across the infrastructure of tomorrow. Thinking of object detection models driving tipping and queuing across constellations, or the ability to move components of mission ops and planning on board, like a prioritization scheme, or the ability to, move, to add additional intelligence to proximity operations, and of course, the resiliency enabled by AI in the event the ground is unreachable. Software-defined satellites and space vehicles with these capabilities will allow for greater application reuse across missions, flexibility within a given mission, and allow us to execute smart missions further and further from Earth. I'm so excited to be here with Luca today to hear how Deorbit is thinking about tackling these capabilities and infrastructure needs today for the space economy of tomorrow. So, um, at the orbit, what we do, it's creating the first space logistics infrastructure to enable the existing trillion dollar space economy, this new space economy that started just a few years ago, but also to enable the human expansion in sustainable space. Um, why logistics? Uh, we tend to, t to keep logistics and to take it for granted here on Earth. But if we think about, even if you produce pens, uh, you need someone to pick up the pens, uh, deliver to the distributor, and then so on to the local shop, in which you can buy a pen for one dollar. Uh, 
So basically there will be no businesses on earth without logistic services. That's why we want to apply the concept of space logistics uh, into this new sector. Um, and uh, why logistics is such a, a new concept for space? Well, you know, at the beginning when the, the space market started like 60, 70 years ago, there was no need for logistics. Uh, satellites were uh, big, uh, extremely performing, uh, extremely expensive, and long lasting in space, several years, 10, 15, in some cases even 20 years uh, in space. And, and basically you were placing a satellite exactly where the satellite was supposed to operate. So the only logistics part that, that the, the space sector was needed was a rocket to bring the satellite in the right position. But now the market is not anymore like that. Uh, we are talking about a new market, a uh, commercial market, that is actually growing exponentially. It's estimated to grow up to 1.4 trillion in less than a decade. And the funny story is that actually there was a report um, um, like a couple of years ago that was predicting that the space market uh, was supposed to grow to 1 trillion by 2040. So actually the market is growing more than expected. But if we look at these numbers in terms of number of satellites that are going to be launched, there are Let's say starting from uh, uh, 3,300 satellites around the Earth today, there are going to grow to more than 65,000 satellites that are going to be launched. Actually, according to some space agencies, this number is already 100,000. So uh, even if we think to cut in half this number, it's still an exponential growth. And all these satellites are completely different from what we were used in the space sector in the past. So they are not anymore huge and extremely expensive. Here we are talking about small satellites, 400 times cheaper than the previous one. Um, they are not long-lasting in space. The, they have a limited life. We are talking about two, three, five years of operational life. And uh, they are not launched as a single unit, but they are launched in groups that are called constellations. And why is that? Well, because you want to have satellites all around the planet in order to deliver the service to all your customers, no matter where they live, no matter where they are. Right, so, and uh, these new models, these new commercial models, are the, basically the maximum of scalability of a business. Uh, just to compare with uh, like another business, let, let's, let's take internet. The fiber optic is the, the best technology today to have internet in our homes. Um, however, if you think about, if you are an internet provider, um, when you want to capture a market share, you dig, you put the fiber optic, then you cover the soil, then you start selling in uh, Houston, then you want to expand, you move to San Francisco, you dig, you put the fiber optic, you cover, and then you have like two towns, so that's, that's your market. And every time that you need to move, then you need to do basically the same things. Then after, I don't know, like 10 years, then the technology is obsolete, then you need to dig again, take away the old fiber, put the new one, and so on. With one satellite constellation, your market is the entire planet. That's, that's the scalability of the space business. So this is driving um, a completely new way of addressing space. So if we really want to understand why these numbers are growing so fast, we shouldn't look at space, actually. We should look at what is happening here on ground. Uh, like most of our industries are moving towards big data, digitalization, industry 4.0, predictive analytics. Uh, agriculture is becoming agri-tech. Uh, finance is becoming fintech. Aut automotive is becoming autonomous driving and, and, and so on. So all these industries are making uh, uh, like more and more use of data from satellites. So the more they go in these directions, the more data are going to be required from satellites and the more satellites are going to be required in space. And this is driving the new space economy. Uh, what is the issue? So as we said, if you have one satellite, well, you just buy a rocket, you put the satellite in that position and you are done. But if you have, let's say that you want to launch um, a dozen satellites to serve the agriculture market or the oil and gas or the energy. So you find a rocket, you put your satellites on. And by the way, finding a rocket is not as simple as it seems. So there's a long delay, uh, uh, typically you have to wait between one and two years to be able to fly. That's not really compatible uh, with, you know, most of the companies uh, would like to do, right? So one, two years, so you have your product ready and you have to wait like a couple of years to, to see it in orbit, but it's not over. So you found the rocket, you have your dozen satellites on board, and then the rocket goes to space and deliver all the satellites in one position in orbit. But that's not really what you want. 
you want your satellites very well distributed around the planet. So what do you do? Well, you wait, right? And you wait between six and 10 months to get your satellite along one single orbit in the right position. Six to 10 months, it's about 30% of the life of your satellite. So not only you are sacrificing 30% of potential revenues, but you are also delaying the revenues. That's really not good. Uh, but it's, again, it's not over because you don't really want to have satellites in one orbit. You want to have satellites in multiple positions around the Earth to serve your customers, to increase the performance and to increase the, like, the, the benefit that you are delivering. And every time that you need to change position, then you need to find another rocket and start again. So you understand that it's really not efficient and you understand why logistics is so important and how, I mean, how the complexity of mission operations is increasing more and more with the requirements of more logistics services. And that's what uh, we do at the orbit. So we have our like, big cargo satellite. It's called ION. ION. Um, it can accommodate several satellites on board. It's uh, pretty much like a truck that you put on the, on the rocket. The rocket delivers my truck in orbit, and then I switch on the engine and I move around uh, like the truck would do to deliver the packages from Houston, uh, New York, San Francisco, and so on, to deliver the packages exactly door to door. We do the same with satellites. So we move around space. We go in the like, location in which that particular satellite needs to operate. We deliver the satellite there. Then we move to another location and so on. And we do that in uh, uh, two to four weeks. So as a matter of fact, we save up to 85% of time from launch to revenues for our customers, but also reduce the cost by up to 40% of the deployment of the entire constellations because with one mission, you can reach multiple options. And uh, you know, what you see here in the, in, in the chart is nice. That's, that's the value proposition, right? So this is what you have to tell to investors usually, but actually there's way more. This is not a service, this is an infrastructure. And now we are learning from our customers how to use this infrastructure in ways that we were not even thinking about. Now customers are coming to us with new ideas how to organize their constellations in orbit. Because now they can, they can reach places, they can reach orbits that were not reachable before. They, can, they don't need to have a lot of propellant on board if they have motors on board of their satellites. Because they can take a taxi, right? So they can use the taxi to move from A to B. I mean, I, I, don't, I didn't bring my car into the plane to come here. Uh, you know, to, to, to run this, uh, I mean, to, to be here and, and presenting. So I just landed and then I took a taxi, right? So uh, why should we have a different way of working in space? So uh, they are optimizing the size of their satellites. Some of the customers, for example, they are reducing the size, saving money. Some others, they are using the extra volume to put additional sensors to multiply the level of like revenue streams that they can generate with a single asset in orbit. So this is happening while we are talking and it's really, really amazing. And and this is how, how it works. So this is our cargo. Uh, you reach space. You start deploying the first satellite. Then you move into another location. Uh, you deploy other satellites. And from this moment, those satellites are ready to operate. We can reach pretty much any place around the Earth. Theoret theoretically, we can even deploy satellites around the moon. The reality is that no one is paying me now to delivering satellites around the moon, but you know, stay tuned because it's coming. So moon base will require internet, for example. And how do you provide internet on the moon? You will need a constellation of satellites around there, and you will need a communication hub that is capable of sending back the signal, right? You want to see Netflix on the moon? Well, that's, that's the way to go, right? So it's, it's going to happen soon. Um, this is, uh, you know, that, that was a nice cartoon. This is the real one. Um, and uh, you see here our production venue with the serial production of our cargos. That's also a very interesting aspect of what is happening in space. And I take this picture as an example. So, um, you know, we, we, we space people tend to look at like at ourselves, right? So we are a small community, we know each other, and, uh, and, uh, but actually the, the new space market is not like that. We don't look at space anymore, as we said before. We look at other, other industries. Our business models are based on the software industries, so we copy what they do. Uh, our production line is actually taken from automotive production lines uh, or like uh, aeroplane production line. So 
you take what is really working well in other industries, adapt it, and then uh, implement it in the space sector. And that's how we manufacture our satellite at a reasonable cost in order to perform the mission and give access to everyone to space. This is our cargo on a, on a rocket. And uh, now you will see in this moment, our cargo starts its mission. So it's moving in the right place in space, and it starts deploying the satellite. Here you see a couple of very small satellites. They are called CubeSats. And from this moment, those satellites are ready to operate. Our customers usually confirm that they get a signal from their satellite between 45 and 90 minutes after we release them in space. And here you see a completely different size of satellites. So that's the beauty of logistics. So you don't care how big is your package when you have to send it, right? So you just go on the website of your provider, you put uh, how much is the weight, uh, the volume, uh, what is the final destination, how fast you want your package to be delivered, you press, you click the button, and then you get the price, right? So that's pretty much how it works. And this is how we work in, in space. There's another element. So as I said, I complete this phase of operations in two to four weeks. And then what? I still have a very good asset in space that I can use to deliver additional services to our customers. So basically, every time that we send the cargo in orbit, we are also creating our own constellation. It's a, it's a different type of constellation. I like to call it a dynamic constellation because it's not in one single orbit. I can move the nodes of this constellation in different places in orbit in order to deliver different type of services to our customers. I want just to give you a couple of examples of services that we, that we are delivering to our customers. So let's take, I mean, this is a, as we said, it's a new market, it's a young market. There are a lot of startups that are creating amazing technologies, amazing sensors to produce data that we cannot even imagine, okay, to, to help our industries on ground. But of course, um, they, they I mean, all these require investments. And if you take um, one startup and uh, the startup goes to an investor, say, oh, look, I have this amazing idea for this product, and the investor, of course, they give money, uh, they come back with a prototype, say, oh, you know, I build my technology. Now give me more money that I need to go to market. And the investor very likely will ask, okay, show me that it's working, right? Before giving you the money, show me that your technology is working. And if you are a space startup, show me that it's working means show me that it's working in space. That's actually a big problem because to get the validation in orbit takes uh, several millions between two and six million dollars and uh, two to five years. That's again not really a good message you want to deliver to your investors, right? So they, they are not as patient as, as we believe. So what we do for them, well, we take care of their payload, we put it on the, on the ion, on the cargo, on top of the satellites that we already have, uh, and then we test the, the technology in a real mission with using a real satellite. So the image you saw, you saw here was an infrared thermal camera that was used to detect wildfire. I will, uh, I will come back to that uh, later on. So basically, you can accelerate the go-to-market for like the, the innovation industry in the space sector. But it's actually the, the reality is that we have customers that are asking us to test technologies that were not initially designed for space. But they think that they have an angle, that they think that they have a, you know, a possibility to sell their products and services in space in the future. They understand the power, the growth of this sector, and they want to be part of it. That's, that's amazing. Industries that were not even thinking to use space, now they want to be part of it. Um, so we talk about startups, but what about grown-up companies? So, so companies that already have satellites in orbit. Uh, let's take, uh, I don't know, an uh, IoT, Internet of Things constellation, uh, 20 satellites already in orbit, and of course to increase the level of service that they want to deliver to their customers and increase the performance, they need to increase the number of satellites. But even if satellites are way cheaper than in the past, they are still quite expensive. You need a lot of capital upfront to build all your satellites. And then you need to buy the launch and, uh, you know, and the operations and so on. So why not installing one of their IoT payload on every cargo that I'm launching in space? So we have done so far eight space missions. We have six cargo in orbit. We deliver more than uh, 70 payloads already in space. And by the end of next year, we will have 20 cargo. So my constellation, dynamic constellation that I mentioned before, will have about 20 satellites in orbit. So if every satellite that I'm launching 
comes with this uh, IoT payload, that particular customer will have access to additional 20 satellites. So it doubled the capacity just renting the satellite, transforming CAPEX into OPEX. And, uh, you know, like paying on a monthly basis, as you do with software, right? So this is another example of how you can uh, uh, use the same assets in a, in, a, in a different way. And what's the next step? Well, the next step for us, so as we said, we are transporting satellites, we are delivering this advanced service to uh, satellite operators. And then, of course, we want to tackle the, the market of in-orbit servicing. This is uh, going to be one of the biggest market for the what I define space-to-space -space market, so servicing who's operating in space. And how we plan to do it, it's pretty much very similar to the model of, uh, I mean, if you think about like AAA here in US, so you have an annual subscription, uh, then you are in the highway, you have a flat tire, what do you do? You pick up the phone, you call, in 20 minutes the truck will arrive, uh, substitute the, the flat tire, you pay for the tire, and then you are free to go, right? So that's pretty much the same. We go to satellites that are already in orbit, we provide life extension, so satellites that run out of fuel, and that, but that are still good, that they can generate additional revenues uh, with this extra life that we can provide. We can move satellites from one position to another position, like taxi service, in order for them to serve different type of markets. Or, very important, at the end of life, uh, you remove the satellites that are not working anymore uh, to avoid collisions with other satellites of your own constellations that actually are, are still working. That's a very important, uh, a very important uh, problem we have in orbit, space debris. And this is a service that will help to reduce the number of debris in orbit. So um, all these services that I mentioned so far, um, they are, you know, they are, there is something that we, didn't, that we didn't talk about. It's the technical complexity that it's required to get there. You know, from my chart and my video, it seems so, oh, wow, nice. They have a nice video of these satellites popping out of my cargo and ready to operate. But imagine the, the computational requirements that you have to go through in order to analyze the mission, understand where to place the satellite, to deliver exactly in the right position, or even for in-orbit servicing, you don't even know if the satellite is broken or not. You have to approach the satellite, understand the shape, understand where to uh, you know, dock with the satellite, and the type of operations, and if it's tumbling or not. So this requires a lot, a lot of computational power. And um, you don't really want to, uh, to do it manually, so you don't want to have uh, 100 people for every cargo that you have in orbit, especially when you are uh, launching hundreds of these vehicles, right? So you want a lot of autonomy. Autonomy comes with computational power. But the, the issue here is that the more computational power you want to add to your satellite, the more energy you will need to have. More energy means bigger solar panels. Bigger solar panels means bigger structure. Bigger structure means higher cost. That's not a very, you know, good idea. It's a, it's a negative spiral of increasing cost that it's not going to make your business model work. So what do we do? Well, uh, uh, when we decide uh, to find a solution for this problem, I, I, was, uh, I was thinking uh, what happened to, like, to us, to the orbit, when we started the company. At the beginning, our mechanical engineers were uh, coming back to me every, let's say, year and a half at the beginning. Uh, saying, oh, Luca, uh, you know, my computer is, is too slow. Can we, can we have a new one? And then they start coming every six months. And then every month they were complaining uh, about the fact that their computer were not fast enough to do, to do the job that they were supposed to do. So what did we do? We switched to the cloud, right? So like 99% of the companies on this planet now, they are using the cloud. So. Uh, if this is true, and if we follow the, like the history of the cloud on Earth, it, it, follow, it went through exactly the same problems that we are facing in space. It's just that on, on, on Earth, we went through these problems way before. And being a new market, we are facing the problem for the first time. The complexity, the computation, that, that, you know, the uh, maneuvering satellites in an in a autonomous way, uh, that's something that is really new. So. Um, if we follow this trend that happened here on Earth successfully, why not following the same trend in space? Why not using uh, not just one satellite with a lot of computational power, 
but actually having a cloud computing network in space that, that can uh, help all the other operators to do a better job. So that's, that's also what we are building at the orbit. So every time we fly, we fly with a server on board. I, I call it server, it's way more complex than just a server, but just to give you an idea. And uh, we have three, three nodes of this cloud computing system in orbit right now that is capable of performing edge computing directly in space. We already test and, uh, tested like dozens of applications already in orbit. And uh, just, just to mention one, uh, there was an algorithm that used, currently is used on ground to detect floodings and to give uh, as fast as possible uh, an alert message to the populations that are you know, at risk of flooding. Um, and the we tested it in space and worked it perfectly, and this actually, it's improving the capabilities of sending faster, li like f faster response to, uh, to whoever need this type of service. Um, and so, step by step, every time we fly, in my dynamic constellation, it's uh, not just a constellation delivering services uh, to other satellite operators, it's also becoming a new level of infrastructure. It's a cloud computing infrastructure in orbit that is going to help me in the future to perform like in orbit servicing and, and uh, like additional, uh, let's say, uh, activities that I'm going to do in the future. But also this is going to help satellite operators that are already in space today. Why satellite operators uh, may, may be interested of a, a cloud computing in orbit? Well, you know, today satellites um, produce a huge amount of data, uh, but just a fraction of this data is downloaded to Earth. Um, and that's because you have a bottleneck in the, in the bandwidth, uh, in the energy that is available on the satellites. You have a bottleneck on the number of ground stations, so the, the antennas that are capturing the signal from the satellite. So um, most of these data stay in orbit and are basically wasted. Um, um, also, when you download the data, uh, not all the data that you downloaded actually are good data, right? So it's pretty much when you take a picture with your phone, you take 20 pictures, but you save only three, because the others are not, uh, not very good. Um, and, then, and then those three pictures that you have taken, uh, then you need to process them, because you don't, I mean, yes, you can sell the picture, but the real value is in the information that is embedded in those pictures. So you, you want to run your AI machine learning application on the cloud, on Earth, uh, extract the information, and sell the information to your customers. What if you could do what we said directly in orbit? You can have access to all the like, additional data that you are not downloading today. You can discard the bad data directly in orbit, you can process using your own algorithm in space, uh, as you do today on ground, and what you are extracting, the information, you don't even to download the picture anymore, that it's actually quite heavy to download. You can download just the information that it's ready to be sold to your customers. So not only you have access to more data, so potentially additional revenues, but also you reduce the time from when you take a picture uh, to the service delivered to your customers. So that's, that's uh, exactly what we are uh, developing and the adventure that we are providing to our customers. So um, this infrastructure is capable of hosting AI application as the cloud is doing here. Uh, you can have immediate results, so you shorten the time of the delivery of your service to your customers. and. Uh, you can use it as a like, normal cloud. You can uh, use it for data storage. You can park your data there and use it in the future. And you can have data fusion, collecting, uh, let's say, uh, data from a variety of different satellites. Because once you have a cloud, then you know, all the satellites can communicate with the cloud. The, uh, another important aspect of this cloud that uh, we didn't tackle before is the fact that this cloud is not going to be like a monopoly of one company. It's going to be a distributed cloud. Space is big. The orbit alone will not be able to cover 100% of the demand. So why not cooperating with anyone else that want to send satellites to create a cloud infrastructure? So our customers will have access to a huge wide cloud that it's capable of delivering way better service than what one single company is capable of doing. That's a new concept. So talking about 
cooperation rather than competition in such a sector, it's really, it's really good. But in a market that is growing so fast, so, and it's, you know, cooperation is way more important than competition. What are the applications? Well, there are, you can, you know, you can invent new applications as we, we do on ground, like native cloud applications in space. But let's say if we want to tackle some of the most important issues that we have in our society on ground, well, let's talk about uh, civil security and, uh, and public protection. It's quite, uh, you know, up-to-date topic today. So you can, uh, uh, you can perform object detection illegal shipping, uh, piracy, smuggling, and, 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 and so on, but also crowd location and detection. And, uh, but you can even monitor the, like, the evolution of, of, of pollution. And you can do that using al your algorithms uh, directly in space. Disar disaster monitoring and, and, uh, and, and fast response, that's, that's really uh, more and more urgent. So we need to deliver this information as soon as possible to save lives. Uh, we can go from wildfires detection, as we said, we had this uh, camera uh, from a, like a third party, from a customer. They want to test the camera, uh, and, uh, but then you need also to elaborate the information if you want to provide a fast response. And, and that's, that's the possibility that we have. You can, uh, you can work on floods, uh, landslides, avalanche, uh, you know, e even bridge. Uh, that, that collapse, that's another issue we have uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, Europe, US, Asia, we are all aligned on the, on the problems and this could be a solution. Uh, Real-time response support, um, uh, cross-task, other satellites as we said before to collect data from uh, like different type of sensors, but also climate weather applications, uh, detection of cyclone, hurricanes, even running precursor of earthquakes. Uh, that's, that's actually a very interesting aspect. So in the future, we will be able to predict earthquakes. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's really a major, major thing. So this is going to help our society to evolve in a better way. And this is going to help our customer satellite operators to accelerate their business in ways that were not thinkable before, thanks to the use of a, a cloud infrastructure directly in orbit. And, you know, so far we talk about what we can do today, what we can uh, uh, do using satellites, improving the way the satellites work today, using the cloud uh, to run applications directly in orbit, shortening the time from, like, space to market. But what's next? Um, as I mentioned before, the orbit is building this uh, logistics infrastructure that is going way beyond Earth. And if we are thinking to project our society into space in the future, then we need also to learn from our mistakes here on ground. And whatever we are going to do in the future, we need to follow a very strict rule. And we need to apply the concept of circular economy in space. That's extremely, extremely important. Um, when you pollute a river here on, here on Earth, it takes years to, to get to the sea. In orbit, if you have a collision, 90 minutes after, you have polluted pretty much all the orbits that are surrounding that. So time is of essence. Those objects move at 20 to, to 30,000 miles per hour. So the, the, the speed, it's really, you know, we cannot even conceive that type of speed. So uh, if, we if we really want to uh, exploit the space environment, because basically it is another environment, as it is the, the land, the sea, and the air, uh, then we need to do it in a smart way. So circular economy, uh, and actually it's more than a, a circle. I'm imagining like a growing spiral that it's, uh, you know, generating benefits. Uh, so um, we tackled before the, the issue of space debris, and we said, yeah, at the end of life, we go and grab the satellite and remove it. And what is happening today, we just take the satellite and uh, send it towards Earth, where it's going to vaporize, basically. Uh, you know, it, it's going to disappear. But that's actually a waste. We are wasting very good source of material uh, just because we don't know what to do with that. What if we, uh, instead of like delivering into a trajectory towards Earth, we just bring the, the dead satellite into a recycling station in orbit? We could recycle satellites. Our ions, for example, our cargos, uh, are designed using the methodology designed to maintenance. So they can be disassembled. In. 
So if you have this recycling station, you can reprocess the satellites. And I don't even know which technology we are going to use. Technology is not of essence anymore, right? Technology is becoming a, a, a commodity. By the time you develop, it's already obsolete. So I'm not really thinking in terms of technology. I'm thinking in terms of what we really want to have in orbit. Recycling stations are going to generate raw materials. And we can use that raw material to produce new spacecraft directly in space. And if, if you are thinking, why should we build spacecraft in space? Well, if you think about, we don't build boats on the desert and move them into the sea. We build them directly in the harbors because they are ready to, to be used. So why should we build satellites on Earth if you are going to use them in space? And on top of that, if you build spacecraft directly in space, they are way more effective. Lighter, bigger, they can transport more goods, people, uh, you know, and the, the performance will increase. So that's, that's a natural step. And once you get there, then you really have the capability of going after other planets and uh, start, uh, you know, new settlements on, uh, on other celestial bodies and create economies on those planets as well, as we said before. So our goal is really to create a connection between Mars, the asteroid belt, Moon and Earth through like sp space logistics routes um, in which you can transport goods, people, and information. Why information? Because without information, all of this will not be possible. And when I say information, I'm thinking about the cloud. So uh, this, the, the picture you see here is just an example of how it could look like. And, uh, and you don't see any like year, right? So, and the, the year at which this is going to happen is not really important. I mean, if you ask me, I have an idea. It's, it's not going to be more than 10, 15 years in the future. But, you know, um, it's not really important because once you have the instruments, once you have the infrastructure, you can really move from market to market. You are not moving from technology to technology. You are moving from market to market. You have the cloud computing that is enabled all of this. You need this infrastructure in order to do that. You follow your customers. You follow your market, and you move step by step. And sooner or later, we will get there. So the Earth to space market that is uh, what I define the current market. So satellites that provide data to ground um, needs an innovative ecosystem to enable what I define as the like the space to space market. Right. So we need to evolve into space to space market. That is where we operate as a as a company. And the space to space market. Why we instead of you know I I build satellites. Why not delivering data to ground? Well, because um, the space to space market is infinite by definition. So it can only grow. So whatever you do there, whatever infrastructure you create there, whatever applications you are going to run on the space cloud can only grow. That application now is going to run around the Earth. Tomorrow is going to run around the Moon. And the day after tomorrow is going to run around Mars. Right? So uh, there are no limits uh, to the use of, of this type of infrastructure. And, uh, and the distributed um, space cloud infrastructure can also provide on demand high power, low latency, uh, distributed uh, computational resource uh, to constellations of innovative satellites. So uh, concluding uh, my presentation today, uh, if uh, at the beginning of this presentation you thought that you know, spending a vacation on the moon uh, was just science fiction, or spending, I don't know, a few times on Mars, or like sending your kids to study on the university on Mars, you know, could seem like unreachable in our, in our life. Well, now you know that it's, uh, it's not very far in the future. We have the instruments. We have companies working on that. We are creating the infrastructures that is going to support that. Uh, and uh, when you will be there, uh, streaming your Netflix favorite movie, you know, while you are sitting on your uh, like terrace looking at the landscape on Mars, and you will look back to Earth, you will see just a small dot. And that's a very important message. So we live. We humans, we live in a spaceship that is called planet Earth. And it's the only thing we have. And yes, we are expanding. We are you know, operating in space. We are expanding the boundaries of this spaceship. So our spaceship is becoming bigger and bigger. But it's still one single spaceship. And we need to take care of our spaceship. right? And, uh, and that's what I 
believe space is going to provide to all of us. So I like to, um, to use this quote that is not mine. It's from uh, Ban Ki-moon. Um, Saving our planet, lifting people out of poverty, advancing economic growth. These are one and the same fight. We must connect the dots between climate change, water scarcity, energy sh shortage, global health, food security, and women's empowerment. Solutions to one problem must be solution for all. And I believe that what I described, that what the space is going to do, the applications and the service that all these space companies that are now in, in orbit are going to provide will help to reach this objective. Thank you very much.